You ever have one of those times where you put on some completely random movie that you've never heard of, and as soon as it starts, your immediate reaction is, how the hell have I never heard of this? Not even that the movie is amazing or particularly suited to your tastes, but just in that it seems like something which surely would have been picked up on in the circles that you're a part of, or mentioned tangentially somewhere as a footnote in the history of the medium? Well, that's how I felt watching Toki no Tabibito Time Stranger. This is not a fantastic film by any stretch. It clearly suffers from trying to adapt a novel trilogy into a 90 minute film and choosing to leave characterization on the cutting room floor, instead favoring neat sci-fi concepts and a time travel plot that doesn't entirely make sense, while concentrating most of its effort into visual splendor. But nonetheless, the first 15 minutes or so of this film were shocking to have never seen before. A long sequence with barely any dialogue and some of the smoothest character animation and effects work that you can find, in a style that's damn near died out in the time since the late 80s. I'm not surprised that this film is relatively obscure, and that it doesn't have the clout of contemporaries like Laputa, Project Eiko, or The Wings of Honeymise. What I am surprised about is that I've never seen it mentioned anywhere at all all. In a world in which abjectly terrible anime films of the era such as Odin are still remembered fondly by some for at least the sheer level of craftsmanship on display in their animation, why is Time Stranger unheard of? Well, in most cases in which an older anime film of questionable quality is still remembered today, it is so either because it had a release outside of Japan, which this film surprisingly didn't in spite of being right along the lines of the kind of stuff that would have been brought over in the late 80s and early 90s, or because because the people who made it were in some way important. It's for reasons like this that an otherwise forgettable film like, say, SF Shinseiki Lensman is still remembered by some today. Not only is it the directorial debut of Yoshiaki Kawajiri, who would go on to massive acclaim for directing Wicked City, Ninja Scroll, and Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust, but it's also one of the first completely independent productions by Studio Madhouse, one of the most beloved animation studios in existence to this day. So after watching Time Stranger for the first time, I immediately rushed to my anime list to see who directed it, only to find that there wasn't even a director listed on the page. Ironically enough, however, the name Madhouse was clearly listed as the studio, and on the staff listing was none other than Yoshiaki Kawajiri as a key animator, alongside Rintaro, one of the founding members of Madhouse with Kawajiri, and an immensely important director in its own right as a producer. Add on to that, key animation from Tensai Okamura, who would go on to direct Metabots, Wolf's Rain, Darker Than Black, and Seven Deadly Sins, among other things, alongside more animation from Yasuomi Umetsu, acclaimed creator of Kite, Mezzoforte, and Wizard Barristers, among other things, and tack onto that, character designs by manga artist Moto Hagio, creator of They Were Eleven, and often regarded as one of the foremothers of modern shoujo manga, and the star power of this film is not to be doubted. But where the hell is the director? Helpfully, Anime News Network had the answer. One Mori Masaki, who'd only directed one other film that I knew anything about, that being Barefoot Gen, the infamous World War II film which depicts the bombing of Hiroshima in excruciatingly extensive detail. If you've been on the internet long enough, then there's a good chance you might have run into this infamous clip of the bomb going off and melting everyone into husks of meat, and thought, holy fucking shit, that is the worst and yet best thing I have ever seen. It was surprising, then, that the director of such a relatively famous film was completely unknown today. Mori Masaki doesn't even have an English Wikipedia page, and you won't find much by searching his name on Google. This is for two good reasons. Firstly, that Mori Masaki arguably never created any masterpieces. All of his films are at best very interesting and full of noteworthy visual moments and relevant industry talent, but none are individually all that memorable, with the exception of Barefoot Gen. And secondly, because the director seemingly blinked off the map after just six years of activity. Were you to follow the information about Mori Masaki that's available in English, it would look like he dabbled in animation briefly for the later half of the 60s, then disappeared for an entire decade, re-emerged as a director in the early 80s, and then evaporated into thin air after the release of Time Stranger in 1986. Thankfully, Japanese Wikipedia knows enough about the guy to fill in the gaps in that story. As it would happen, Mori Masaki had been primarily an extremely prolific manga artist, starting his career in 1960 and 
penning stories all the way up into the mid-90s. Most of his manga is themed around student movements and youth in revolt, and while little of it seems to be remembered all that well even by Japanese Wikipedia, a few stories are noted for their experimental nature. So yes, in a way, Mori Masaki did in fact just dabble in animation for about 8 years at a time in the 60s and 80s when he wasn't on a constant grind of creating manga for nearly 40 years, after which he did in fact seemingly disappear, but considering that the man is 76 years old, I'd like to imagine he's just gone into retirement. Now, if Mori Masaki was just a short-term anime director with a handful of neat visual ideas up his sleeves, then he might not be worth bringing to your attention like this. But there is more to this director's work that I find not only fascinating, but integral to the complete picture of anime's history. After all, we're talking about a guy who not only helmed Madhouse's first independent productions, but would then direct and work alongside a lot of the studio's core founders in the years to come. While his career may not have continued for long enough for him to evolve into a legend, like Kawajiri, at the time, his contemporaries would have at least seen enough in him to let him man the production of groundbreaking and talent-laden films. So what's his deal? Well, as little information as I could find about this dude's personal life, there was one detail on a defunct Japanese fan site's bio that I found to be a definitive influence on the man's work. That he was born in Yokohama in 1941, and therefore in 1945 would experience firsthand the Great Yokohama Air Raid, a firebombing effort which razed 40% of the city to the ground and killed an estimated 7 or 8,000 people in the course of about an hour. There is no question that this first-hand experience of the Second World War would have a massive impact on Masaki, to the point that he would later direct the most mind-searingly complete vision of the atrocity of an atomic explosion to ever be put to film some 40 years later. While it is true that Barefoot Gen was based on a manga from the early 70s by Keiji Nakazawa, who would actually write the screenplay for the film adaptation himself, I have no doubt that Masaki had a personal interest in this story as well, and not only because he would later depict the Yokohama carpet bombings in the first act of Time Stranger. Mori Masaki's manga was, after all, centered on student movements and protest, and there is a strong undercurrent of anti-war and especially anti-nationalist sentiment even in his anime work. In Barefoot Gen, the main character's father explicitly blames the Japanese government for the suffering that the people are experiencing because of their refusal to surrender a clearly losing battle, and he is considered unpatriotic because of it. Masaki's earlier film, Hagure Gumo, focuses on a former samurai who has been disillusioned with the idea of fighting for any greater cause than simply living life to the fullest and enjoying himself, and who regards war and fighting as a pointless waste of time. Looking at Mori Masaki's work, it seems pretty clear that he's someone who despises war out of having experienced the depths of its destruction firsthand. Having spent his formative years consuming cartoons and manga, especially from Osamu Tezuka, Masaki would later join Tezuka's own animation studio, Mushi Productions, in 1963, just two years after its establishment and at the precise moment that TV anime was first being born. But before we talk about that, we need to set the stage for what anime was like at the time. Towards the end of the 1950s, the Japanese film production company Toei created an animation division, which began producing Japan's first ever full-length, full-color animated features, starting with Hakujaden in 1958. Toei Animation and its founding talents would be a primordial soup for much of what anime was going to become over the next 60 years, inspiring and then assimilating the likes of Isao Takahata, Hayao Miyazaki, and Leiji Matsumoto. For lack of a better comparison, they were the Disney of Japanese animation, a studio producing work leagues beyond what anyone else could hope to achieve at the time or for long to come, and doing so on a yearly basis for decades. Around that time, Toei would approach nationally famous manga legend Osamu Tezuka about allowing them to adapt one of his works to animation, which would manifest in the 1960 film Alakazam the Great. Tezuka's involvement with this film would lead him to become interested in animation and to try to create a competitor to Toei Animation, thus the foundation of Mushi Productions. Tezuka and Mushi Pro would then pioneer a litany of cost-cutting techniques, which allowed anime to be created on shoestring budgets and tight production schedules, arguably ruining the entire medium forever, but also creating basically all TV anime as we know it. In 1963, Mushi Pro's first TV serial based on Tezuka's own manga, Astro Boy, would go to air, with Toei hot on their tail, producing the higher quality Wolf Boy Ken in the same year, and other competitors to the TV anime throne emerging not long afterwards, such as Tatsunoko Productions and their ever popular Speed Racer series. In spite of how influential Mushi Pro was, however, it was also short-lived 
thanks to a fountain of financial problems. Tezuka himself would bail on the studio after just five years in 1968, and go off to form a new studio called Tezuka Productions. Another five years later, Mushi Pro would file for bankruptcy and completely die, re-emerging later as a smaller studio which continued doing animation assistance work into the 2010s. The death of Mushi Pro in 1972 would in turn become the foundation of two of the industry's most important animation studios, namely Studio Sunrise and Studio Madhouse, each of which seemingly took a very different approach to their operation. Sunrise developed a system in which the producers were the main voices in charge, and sped down the road of commercial anime, quickly establishing a focus on mecha series, and later exploding to the forefront of TV anime with the success of Mobile Suit Gundam in 1979. Studio Studio Madhouse, meanwhile, would mostly work in assistant animation and co-productions throughout the 70s before establishing their own distinct voice in the early 80s. Looking at the founding members of Madhouse, it's not hard to see how the studio would end up the way that it would. Producer Masao Maruyama has spent his entire career taking huge risks on visionary directors that he personally believes in, allowing the careers of directors like Satoshi Kon to flourish in the late 90s and early 2000s, and generating no shortage of the most bold and beloved beloved TV anime of all time over the course of 30 plus years. Rintaro, who had directed the TV series Wanpaku Tanteidan at Mushi Pro right after Tezuka's departure, would later be heralded as one of the medium's great visualists, starting with his acclaimed work on the 1979 film Galaxy Express 3-9 with Toei Animation, and later being known for films which, while exceptional in visual presentation, are perhaps questionable in their writing, such as X-1999 and Metropolis. Yoshiaki Kawajiri, who would have been just 22 years years old when Mushi Pro died and Madhouse was founded, would become a force to be reckoned with in the 80s, thanks to his unique approach to visceral, hyper-masculine action films. All of these are staffers with a deep penchant for visual experimentation and hyper-detailed animation on adult-themed works, with less concern about great narrative storytelling and more attention to pure visual artistry. So where does Mori Masaki fit into all of this? When we last left him, it was 1963, and he was joining Mushi Pro right as they got into the swing of producing TV anime. In his time at the studio, he would primarily work as a production coordinator and producer, but never as one of the main creative forces behind a project. He would leave the studio not long after Tezuka's departure, but not before he got the chance to work with Rintaro on the production of Wanpaku Tanteidan and Sabuto Ichi Torimono Hikai in 1968. If I had to guess, I would say that Masaki saw Mushi Pro as a sinking ship whose captain had already jumped, and decided it would be a better idea to pursue his manga career full-time instead, as it was starting to take off at the very same time. While his old Mushi Pro buddies were toiling away at turning Madhouse into a major production studio, he was busy making a name for himself as a prolific manga artist. But this all changed at the advent of the 80s. After having spent the better part of a decade doing assistant production to TMS Studios, mostly on shows directed by Osamu Dezaki, such as Aim for the Ace, Treasure Island, and Nobody's Boy Remy, Madhouse was ready to come into their own and start producing their own work, and the man who they chose to helm their first major co-productions as well as their first independent ones was none other than Mori Masaki. To be completely honest, I have no idea how it is that Masaki became the head director in this early period of Madhouse films. Maybe it was because Rintaro, in spite of having co-founded the studio, remained a freelancer, and was busy with Galaxy Galaxy Express 3.9 in its sequel at the time, later making his first directorial work with Madhouse in Harmageddon, for which Mori Masaki wrote the screenplay in 1983, releasing just a few months before Barefoot Gen, amounting to the studio's first independent films. I'm not sure why Lensman is the one which Wikipedia remembers as having come first, but I imagine it has to do with Harmageddon being pretty widely critically panned, and Barefoot Gen being a waking nightmare. Perhaps Kawajiri wasn't seen as ready yet, or took longer on his film, as Lensman would release in 1984, and his follow-up, Wicked City, would be another three years off, as he continued to work as a prolific key animator and storyboard artist. Whatever the case may be, after returning to the world of anime with some storyboard work for Madhouse's TV series Marco Polo's Adventures in 1979, Mori Masaki would go on to direct their 1981 and 1982 co-productions with Toei Animation, A Door Into Summer and Hagure Guma respectively, followed by writing the script for Rintaro's Harmageddon, which released in 1983, directing Barefoot Gen, which released shortly thereafter, writing the script for Rintaro's The Dagger of Kamui, which released in 1985, doing conceptual design work for the bizarre Bobby's Girl OVA that same year, and then finally directing Time Stranger in 1986 before disappearing from the anime industry forever. 
Appearing and disappearing from the industry like this is supremely weird, and it's hard not to imagine that Madhouse basically got this guy on board so that he could manage them in their most important growth period while they transformed into a well-oiled machine, and then he just kinda took off when he wasn't needed anymore. Maybe he wasn't satisfied with Time Stranger, which is by far the most visually impressive film that he made in spite of its lackluster storyline, or maybe he just wanted to get back to manga. Either way, what he left in his wake was a catalog that you could burn through in a couple of days and find a few things to think about. So let's run through it all. First things first is A Door Into Summer, an hour-long experimental drama co-produced by Madhouse and Toei Animation in 1981. This film was based on a shoujo manga by Keiko Takemiya, who had helped to foster the boys' love genre in the 1970s, and the film itself features elements of gay romance alongside surprisingly explicit sex scenes, which can very easily qualify as rape scenes in spite of this being primarily a teen drama. The story follows a handful of beautiful boarding school students in France over the course of one summer, during which they spend their time fighting over women via macho posturing. Our main character is a gorgeous blonde boy who shares a mutual crush with the most elegant girl in school, but is terrified of sex and women and runs away at even the mere mention of either. This all changes, however, when an older woman rescues him from the rain and basically rapes him until he likes it. From there, the film enters a downward spiral of relationships falling apart as our hero becomes a sex-crazed bohemian and ruins everything. While the film's writing and drama were just barely engaging enough to hold my attention to the end, by far the most perplexing element of this film is its visuals, which range from exalted brilliance to just janky. Most of the character design and artwork is exceptional, and at times the film lapses into fully painted scenes which make for the best visual moments in the piece. There's some inventive shot compositions, interesting uses of color and shadow, and scenes with mountains of dramatic flair, but connecting all of that is a backbone of consistently lackluster animation, which can leave certain scenes outright ugly or laughable. When Justin Savakis wrote about this film for his Buried Treasure column back in 2009, he drew a visual comparison to the 1973 erotic anime film Belladonna of Sadness, which was released by Mushi Pro right around the time when the studio was breaking apart and filing for bankruptcy. Personally, I found a lot of visual similarities to the style of Osamu Dezaki, who is considered a founding member of Madhouse and whom the studio had been working with on all of their 70s co-productions, in spite of him not directing any independent Madhouse productions himself until much later. Suffice it to say that any fans who enjoy tracing the visual lineage of directors like Revolutionary Girl Utena's Kunihiko Ikuhara or Uran High School Host Club's Takuya Igarashi may want to give this movie a glance. I wouldn't call it a visual masterpiece or anything, but it's its theatrical and melodramatic presentation may resonate with some viewers a lot more than it did with me. How much this film can tell us about the individual style of Mori Masaki is questionable. Across his four films, Masaki didn't really form a particularly clear identity. It's obvious that like everyone else at Madhouse, he was very visually focused and more interested in conveying emotions and ideas in animation than in dialogue, but his methods for going about this are varied, and none of his films goes as heavily into the realm of pure abstraction and art house as Rintaro's do. But by the time you get to the lengthy sex scene in the center of the film, with its extensive use use of painted imagery and lengthy narrated passages of characters in the throes of passion, it's obvious that whoever directed this is certainly interested in experimentation. It is worth noting that some sources credit this film as having been co-directed by one Toshio Hirata, and while this crediting isn't consistent online, and I can't read enough Japanese to just confirm it in the film's credits, it would certainly make sense for that to be the case. Toshio Hirata was yet another ex-Mushi Pro staffer who would rise to the position of director in the 80s and would have a much longer career in the anime industry than Masaki, mostly directing lots of children's shows, including many Osamu Tezuka adaptations. In the same year as Adore into Summer, he would also direct the Unico adaptation, which was a co-production of Tezuka Pro and Hello Kitty creators Sanrio, with assistant work from Madhouse, which incidentally is totally worth checking out. He would also co-direct Barefoot Gen with Mori Masaki a couple of years later, and then helm the sequel Barefoot Gen 2 by himself, while Masaki was busy with Time Stranger in 1980. So just how much of this film was the result of Hirata's involvement? Well, returning once more to Justin Savakis and his Buried Treasure column, let's have a look at his write-up for Hirata's 1985 OVA, Bobby's Girl. In it, he praises the OVA's bizarre style of experimental visuals, noting how the OVA feels like a music video, rich with detail and mood. He also confesses that from what little of Hirata's work he's seen, none of it resembles this OVA enough to be helpful in recognizing the director's style. Meanwhile, 
Hattori Masaki is credited on this OVA for conceptual design, an unusual title for an anime production, and one that seems suggestive to me that maybe the weird design elements of this OVA were all his doing. Now personally, I think that Bobby's Girl is the worst of all the anime that Masaki was involved with in the 80s, because for all of its experimental visuals and moments of really striking animation, the thing is very weirdly paced, not particularly interesting, and has an unsatisfying ending. Could this be because Hirata was less fit to direct this kind of highly experimental and visually driven work than Masaki might have been? I don't have the answer to these questions, but it's worth wondering about. Anyways, following the release of Adore into Summer by just a year was yet another Madhouse and Toei co-production in the form of the made-for-TV movie Hagure Gumo, based on a manga which started in 1973 and apparently just ended like three months ago, what the hell? This one, as aforementioned, is about a former samurai who now runs a courier service that he doesn't really do anything to manage and instead spends his time fucking around and cheating on his wife while being a questionable parent to his two kids. Hagure Gumo is mostly a slice-of-life film focused on the relationship between the titular protagonist and his runty smart aleck son, from whom he is somewhat estranged. This tale is set over the backdrop of political upheaval and secret police fighting at the tail end of the Edo period of Japanese history. Historical figures and events play a role in the main narrative, but all of it is tangential to a more simple story about this affable asshole stumbling his way through domestic life and trying not to get dragged into any more fighting than he has to be. It's not an amazing film, but I enjoyed it a good bit and would recommend it to fans of historical pieces that don't take themselves too seriously, such as Miss Hokusai. Like Adore into Summer, Hagure Gumo doesn't so much contain a lot of obvious directorial calling cards as it does just reflect a general interest in visual storytelling and tons of excellent shot compositions. In spite of being more dialogue heavy and comedically focused than Masaki's other films, this one doesn't slouch on gorgeous painted artwork, dramatically colored sequences, and excellent usage of color. Perhaps the most memorably experimental scene in the film is a two minute sequence depicting the assassination of real historical figure Ryoma Sakamoto, which is handled entirely in a roughly hand-drawn, mostly black and red animation style penned entirely by Yoshiaki Kawajiri himself. Stylistically, this bears a strong resemblance to the sequence which Yasuomi Umetsu would animate for Time Stranger a few years later, which makes me wonder if these were sequences which Masaki singled out for individual talented animators to tackle on their own. I suppose if I could highlight one recurring attribute of how Masaki's films are paced, it would be the usage of one lengthy, intense, and kind of fucked up sequence to break a film into what it was like beforehand and what it was like afterwards. In Adore into Summer, this was the insanely long sex scene. And in Barefoot Gen, it is the explosion of the atomic bomb. If there is any Mori Masaki film that you need to watch, Barefoot Gen is that film. Not even because it's an amazingly crafted piece of work. In fact, it has a number of issues. The child actors performing the main characters are not the best at emoting in the film's darker scenes, and the animation is of inconsistent quality, which, combined with the dated character designs, has made the film age less gracefully than other Madhouse works of the time. Additionally, the film's writing is incredibly straightforward, and has the main purpose of horrifying the viewer as much as humanly possible at all the terrible things that happen to all these regular people. Which is also the film's greatest strength, because it's based on a true story of what is in fact one of the most horrifying moments in human history. Suffice it to say that Barefoot Gen is not an easy film to watch. Even before the bomb goes off, we learn extensively about how difficult it was just to live in Japan at the time of the war. A particularly prescient line of dialogue being that even money can't buy you food. Our protagonist comes from an average family of five going on six that struggles with hungry children and a sickly pregnant wife in a world where no one is really doing much better. After the bomb detonates and more than half of this family dies along with basically everyone in Hiroshima, we are not taken out of the epicenter of the carnage in the way that other post-bombing World War II films such as Grave of the Fireflies or Ushiro no Shomen Dare invite us to be. No, Gen and his mother have to set up camp right there in the middle of the destruction and watch the grueling fallout surrounding them as more and more people suffer and die in all directions. A huge portion of this film is spent with our characters inhabiting what might look like a post-apocalyptic zombie film if we didn't know that this was literally a thing that happened. Unlike Masaki's other films, this one is a lot more sparse on experimental visual design, but this is obviously intentional, as it makes the centerpiece of the movie that much more effectively insane. After half an hour of a pretty normal and realistic take on 1940s Japan, we dive into some 
10 minutes of high-octane nightmare fuel as the world disintegrates around our main characters. Parts of it are sickening and truly difficult to sit through, and by god it is effective. I can admit that while Grave of the Fireflies never managed to make me cry the way it did with other audience goers, there were moments in Barefoot Gen that turned me into a sobbing mess. For the next three years after this film's 1983 release, Mori Masaki would only show up in writing credits on a couple of Rintaro's films and in the aforementioned conceptual design credit on Bobby's Girl, before finally re-emerging to direct his last film, Toki no Tabibito Time Stranger, in 1986. As I talked about at the start of the video, this was easily Masaki's most visually luscious film, overflowing with talented animation staff and almost wordless, visually arresting sequences. In many ways, it almost feels like a patchwork film, constructed by taking each scene and then deciding how to make it look interesting on its own, if such a thing could be done. Parts of it are much more typical, especially when there's a lot of exposition to be dumped, but I never stopped being impressed by the amount of gorgeous character art and animation accomplished in spite of featuring relatively complex designs. If you wanted to check out this director more as a Sakuga nerd with an interest in exceptional animation from the golden age of high-budget anime productions, then this may be the film to seek out. I know that's why I enjoyed it, and I had a pretty solid time with it. And that's about all I've got to say about Mori Masaki. I'm sure that other, more qualified researchers could comb these films more thoroughly to tell you about every relevant staff member involved, and maybe even pick up on more of Masaki's individual characteristics which I wasn't able to identify in a cursory viewing of his works. My goal here is less to provide a comprehensive deep dive into this director's career, and more to bring him to the attention of anime discourse in the first place. Maybe this is the most that anyone will ever say about the guy, or maybe someone else will find even more intrigue in his career than I did and expand on all of this in the future. At the very least, I hope that this video will be enough to get the guy a goddamn English Wikipedia page. Watching all of these films made me feel lucky to be living in an era in which damn near every random obscure film that no one remembers has somehow been subtitled, and I can't give enough thanks to the groups who have made all of this stuff viewable so that we can continue to expand our knowledge on anime history. If you enjoyed this video and would like to help me to make more stuff like this, then consider supporting me on Patreon, where you'll also get access to tons of stuff that I haven't posted anywhere else, as well as a more organized way of keeping up with my content in general, because I've made a hell of a lot of it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.